Uh, so first, um, I would like to welcome you all. My name is Eran Neumann. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of the Arts here at Tel Aviv University. I would like to say good evening to our distinguished guest, Professor Lev Manovich, who's in South Korea right now. Uh, so good afternoon, good evening to him, and uh, good afternoon to everyone here in Israel, and good morning or whatever to all those who are elsewhere. Um, I'm very glad you've joined us for the second conversation in the series Art, Culture and Society in the Post-Coronavirus Age, in which we're trying to make some sense of this, uh, this moment of history that we're all experiencing, uh, something very, which is, uh, it has a big impact on all of us. We're trying to understand what does it mean for us, and especially for, for communities of art and, and other communities. Well, I'm sure our renowned guests need no introduction. I'll leave this pleasant duty to Dr. Ohad Landesman from the Steve T. School of Film Television, who will converse with uh, Professor Manovic shortly. And I would like to thank Ohad, to take the opportunity to, to thank Ohad and also to thank the school, the, the Steve T. School of Film and Television and its head, Professor Az Yosef, for the collaboration. Before I hand our virtual mic to Ohad, uh, I'd like to say a few words about this series and today's talk. While much about the coronavirus pandemic remains unknown, one thing is absolutely clear. The pandemic has brought about massive changes in almost all aspects of our lives. As the physical realm narrowed and became, uh, became ever more limited, and social distancing literally forced us apart, the virtual, virtual dimension took over and became a crucial locus of meeting, conversation, as we're doing now, and full range of social interactions. Many people complain about this situation, sometimes bitterly, while others capitalize on what looks like the rebirth of the homo virtualis. Actually, the virtual is nothing new to humankind, for humankind. As a matter of fact, without the ability to create virtual structures, humankind wouldn't have been able to achieve some of its remarkable accomplishments. Just think, without the invention of semiotics, systems and the alphabet, or the construction of ways to measure time and divide it into units, or the development of mathematics, all, all of which are based on virtuality, we almost certainly couldn't have reached where we are today. To rephrase, to paraphrase, kind of in a vice versa way, Bruno Latour, we can say that we've always been virtual. The big question now is where does the current pandemic and the shift of the virtual dimension take us? The effects of virtuality have evolved over the course of thousands of years, so how will the current stage affect us uh, as human subjects and how it will shape art, human, human interaction, knowledge, knowledge transference, and more. I'm sure that today's conversa conversation will bring us some valuable insights about, about these, these questions. And now let me introduce Dr. Ad Lanzesman, who will, as I said, converse with uh, Professor Manovich about media and art. Ad is a lecturer of film studies at the Steve T. School of Film and Television here at Tel Aviv University. Uh, we just lost Manovich. He, he holds a a PhD from the Department of Cinema Studies at New York University. And his dissertation focuses on aesthetic implementations of digital developments in contemporary doc documentary cinema. His rec recent publication uh, appeared in several anthologies of documentary culture, mo most recently in vocal projection, sound and documentary, and in peer reviewed journals such as Visual Anthropology Review, Studies, studies in Documentary Film, Projection, uh, the Journal for Movie and Mind, and Animation. Uh, he is currently working on a monograph about documentary visits to Israel uh, in the 1960s and 70s, and is co-editing an anthology, Vision on Documentary Cinema, that, to be published in Amoved next year. So I'll take the lead, and I'm just going to say goodbye for the time being. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Iran, and thank you for these words of introduction. Thanks for... Um, inviting me to conduct this conversation. Good evening to Professor Lev Manovich. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very uh, honored and delighted to have with us here today um, 
a seminal figure in the field of media studies. Professor Lev Manovich is undoubtedly one of the leading theorists of uh, digital culture worldwide and is a pioneer in the application of data science for analysis uh, of contemporary culture. Professor Manovich is the author of 13 books, including AI Aesthetics from 2018, Theories of Software Culture from 2017, Instagram and Contemporary Image 2017, Software Takes Command from Bloomsbury in 2013, Black Box White Cube from Murderlock Berlin in two, uh, 2005, Soft Cinema coming from MIT Press in 2005, and The Language of New Media from MIT Press published in 2001, which was described as the most suggestive and broad-ranging media theory since Marshall McLuhan, and is a book that surely shows up time and again um, in almost every class of our digital media track here in the film and television school. Professor Manovich also has written over 140 articles, which have been published in 35 countries, reprinted over 500 times. He's also one of the editors of the Software Studies book series, coming from MIT Press as well, Quantitative Methods in Humanities and Social Science book series coming from Springer, and uh, hopefully we'll get to talk about a few of those books. He was included in the list of 25 people shaping the future of design in uh, 2013, and the list of 50 most interesting people building the future in 2014. Professor Manovich is a presidential professor at the Graduate uh, Center at CUNY, and the director of the Culture Analysis Analytic Lab that pioneered analysis of visual culture using computational methods. The lab created projects for the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, New York Public Library, Google, and other clients. His latest book, Cultural Analytics, will be published by the MIT Press later in this year. Professor Manovich received grants from fellowships from Guggenheim Foundation, Andrew Mellon Foundation, Natural Science Foundation, National Endowment of the Arts, Twitter, and many other agencies. He's um, very much in demand to lecture on digital culture topics around the world. Um, since uh, 1999, he presented over 650 seminars, lectures, and masterclasses. I know for a fact that he's doing eight different lectures for different conferences and schools around the world only this month. And even today, this is his third lecture, I believe. So we, I feel, we feel, I should say, all very lucky and privileged to have Professor Manovich here with us today in this Dean special uh, series about art and culture in the post-coronavirus age. So thank you, Professor Manovich. Yeah. Thank you, Ohad, for... Uh, Ohad is the right way to say it? Yeah, yes. Ohad, yeah. Thank you for this introduction. You read my CV and I feel terrified because it sounds like I have no life, right? All I'm doing is publishing books, giving lectures. In reality, most of the time, I just wander, you know, sit in a cafe, um, and uh, the reason I'm productive is because I, I kind of like, I don't play by the rules. So later I will tell you my secrets. Uh, I'm a bit of an academic terrorist. Uh, I, never, I almost never send a single article to the peer review journal. That's why I'm able to publish so much. Uh, but um, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, actually, my first time in Israel was uh, very late. Uh, it was just last year. Uh, but you know, there was some flu going on, not the corona flu, but different flu. <laughs> so yeah. I got in, I immediately got sick and actually couldn't really do much. So I haven't really seen anybody. So maybe this is my real first virtual, sort of, sort of, you know, sort of speak virtual visit to Tel Aviv. Okay, so well, let's, uh, let's, yeah, uh, let's as, as we say in Russia, Pagnale. Let's start with this, uh, with this track from a personal perspective. Yeah. Um, looking maybe uh, at um, something that you, I've recently read coming from your Facebook account, uh, an online meeting called Saving the World. And I've heard you speak about the current crisis and praising the current state of things, um, at least from the academic point of view of an intellectual in terms of production. And you said that we always feel the need to respond to the current state of events, uh, to stay updated, and obviously this is a big challenge for you as a scholar of, of technology that is rapidly changing. And suddenly there is this state of affairs or crisis that allows you as an intellectual to linger, to stay put, to ponder. And you said that now that you stop traveling, you've never felt as happy as you've been feeling for the past few months. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you hope that things maybe perhaps in this direction would not change, would not go back to normal. So I wonder, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how the past few months have been for you as an intellectual. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, so I think with experience of this time, 
So very much depends on your age and where you are in your career. So especially for younger people, right? It's very important to travel uh, because, you know, the, I mean, even though you can do all work virtually, right? You can do science virtually, you can do like, you can operate factory virtually, right? You can, I mean, definitely, you know, you know there's lots of scientific collaborations, which all happens via, you know, Zoom, Google Docs and so on. We humans, you know, we like to trust people with whom we collaborate uh, and with whom we fall, you know, fall professional ties. Uh, so for that reason, right, you know, uh, Right. I mean, if you go to China, you want to make a business contract, you have to go drink like for, for a few nights, right, with people. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's very important for people to see each other. And uh, I told you that I'll kind of share some secrets of my career. Um, so when I got my PhD in 93, it was not a single journal, there was not any place in America where I can publish work about kind of cultural effects of computation because it, it, it didn't interest anybody yet. People talked about postmodernism, other things. And when I found out that there were already a few places in Europe and Japan, uh, Arts Electronica Festival, Isaiah Festival, some people in Berlin, you know, and I didn't have any grants. So I just started paying my own money and going to these conferences. In a couple of years, I knew everybody because our, our whole world was 150 people. And then, of course, people started to invite me. Then after that, I never paid for my own trip again. Uh, so I think especially for younger people, right, it's, you know, it's a bit of a tragic story because it is very important, I think, to travel and, uh, you know, we want to see each other face to face. For me, right, who gave so many lectures, it's been a wonderful time. Also, you know, sometimes I have this, I feel like, you know, like I almost have this once in a while ability to see in the future a little bit. It sounds a bit mysterious, uh, but, you know, as, as you know, like you're still using my essay about what is digital cinema. 1995 mm -hmm. is still relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe once in a while, professionally, I can kind of predict some issues which become important in about 10 years. But you know, there is no mystery here because simply, right, I first learned programming as a kind of high school student in Moscow and Russia. And then I took one programming class as undergraduate at NYU. And then I started to work on computer animation, 3D computer graphics in 84. So by the time like the whole excitement about new media, digital culture started in the mid 90s, I already had you know, 10 or 20 years of experience. Um, so this I think allows me sometimes to look at the kind of longer, lo longer trends and once in a while to anticipate things before they happen. And in terms of a virus, it's a very strange thing. You know, I had a sabbatical uh, year last year. So in some, many American universities, not only American, every six years, the seventh year, you don't have to teach, they kind of pay your salary, and you go do research somewhere. Right? So normally people go to the university and stay with some colleagues. And I said, well, okay, I need to do research. But you know, I, don't, I can't learn so much from any particular human. I'm interested in humanity. And I don't want to go to any particular place uh, because you know, my main research topic is so-called cultural analytics, which is basically trying to understand, trying to see the whole landscape of cultural change worldwide. So I said, I'm just going to travel. <laughs> and I spent, you know, um, I spent 30 months traveling nonstop with my wife uh, and not just going to a place for a day, but going for a few days. So when I calculated in total over 13 months, we stayed in, in uh, 27 different cities in 18 countries. Oh, wow. So when the virus uh, happened and there is no possibility to travel, I said, thank God, I don't want to go anywhere anymore, right? <laughs> So for me, it was a very good timing because I've done all my travel before. Um, but I want to say one thing about uh, the topic, right, of this, of this wonderful discussion series. And also, as you said, we feel sometimes we have to respond uh, to yeah. events. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's something very strange going on, you know, uh, because globalization uh, starts approximately 30 years ago, right, with the end of Cold War, 1991, the collapse of communist states, and at the same time, uh, Tim Berners-Lee invents World Wide Web. So these two things happen in parallel. And the web is just one of a number of mechanisms uh, which brings the world closer. And uh, then we had some global events, right? It was a kind of financial crisis in America in 2000, but it was mostly America. Then there was another financial crisis in 2008. It affected many more countries, but not all the countries. 
There was also a very important financial crisis in 97, but that was mostly Asia. And this event, I think it's the first global event in the history of globalization. Yeah. But why? Not only because the virus kind of right knows very border and because the increased connectivity uh, kind of brings it everywhere, but because all the news, right, all the blogs, all the universities, all the journals, everybody feels we have to talk about virus, right? So I go to endless websites of cultural institutions, of academic journals, and so on, and everybody feel we have to say something about virus. And I don't understand why. Mm -hmm. you know? I'm not saying what you're doing is a good thing, it's a good thing. But let's wonder why we have to do it. Okay, if you like newspaper, you know, if you're New York Times, you know, you have to basically right have people click and you like the stories. So virus is perfect for newspapers, for media, because it's like the story we can report. But why do academics have to become like journalists? Why we have to always say something about the new thing? You know, when I think last year in Notre Dame, right, was a fine Notre Dame, like everybody I know posted something about it on Facebook. Why? So to me, it reminds me a bit of my life in communist Soviet state, you know, where you go to a you know, meeting of young pioneers and they say some kind of slogan, everybody has to like, you know, vote, everybody has to raise their arm. Because if you don't raise your arm, it looks strange. So it seems like to me it's a communist voting, right? So, okay, so there's a pandemic going on, that's very important. You can talk about it with your friends. Why do you have to post about it on Facebook? You know, right. Maybe it's a better to spend this time uh, to actually stop what you're doing, to learn something new, I don't know, to learn meditation, uh, to learn some subject you never learned about. And to me, you know, it's a very dangerous thing because I've been looking recently at many syllabi of online classes, like in some areas, you know, which are sort of my areas, I mean, media theory, media studies, digital culture. You know, and when I was going to PhD, right, you know, we had this syllabi which will start with Marx or start with you know, Freud. So at least 100 years ago. Today you find many university syllabi where all the papers are from one last, last year. Okay. Mm -hmm. I really have seen many syllabi in America in media studies or digital culture, or whatever. The latest paper, the earliest paper was 2017. Mm -hmm. So this kind of presentism, which uh, we can understand in terms of news, I think it's very dangerous. And, uh, you know, so you say, okay, how did the life, how did the culture change in the post virus era? Well, maybe the next week there's an explosion or there's another virus, and then it's going to be strong, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so this virus is very important. It will change things, but it's not like First World War. It's not like a Second World War yet, right? So far, not many people died. Uh, it will have economic effects. But for now, it actually hasn't been such a huge thing, and more things are coming because of global warming, because of the typhoon and so on. So I think it's very important that we don't become this, like, this automata who simply react to everything which happens in front of us, you know, without sure. having some distance. So stemming from what you're, you're, you're saying and definitely not wanting to turn you into a journalist or to force you to respond to the, no, to the crisis. <laughs> I think what really evolves from, from your current and ongoing research is something very relevant is, first of all, of course, one cannot make sense of contemporary culture with, or write about it without some understanding of computer vision uh, research and trajectories. But I, I think this may be a good time to speak about big data and not without any relevance, again, to COVID-19, because um, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about the Cultural Trends Lab and your current big data project about the history of art biennales. You mentioned the, the financial crisis and its effect. I think this is very relevant to what you are already doing. Um, and this is an experiment in which you examine the growth of art biennales from 1895 to 2019. Sure just before the, the COVID uh, uh, erupted. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and that gives us quantitative ideas of growth and, and shows uh, that in the last few decades, contemporary culture has expanded very significantly, both in terms of its geographic diffusion and of course, numbers of institution. But while it's hard to predict accurately what's going to happen to the art world after the virus pandemic, as you yourself already said, your project interestingly shows that the effects of the 2008 global financial crisis on the Biennale growth were limited. So 
Can you tell me a little bit about this, tell us a little bit about this research and what is it that we can deduce or learn from it from such quantitative analysis about the, the effect of the current pandemic on the art world? Sure, sure. So I'm going to share the screen uh, so I can show some graphs and show you a bit about this project. All right, please do. So here we are. Uh, so here's the so-called cultural trend lab. So this is a bit confusing because I have only one real lab. The lab is called Cultural Analytics Lab. And this lab has been around since 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is like a fake lab, meaning there is no lab, it's just me. What happened is that the University of Timen in the middle of Siberia invited me to do a project and they gave me complete freedom. And they said, we're going to finance it. Like that's a whole different lecture, right? I mean, that's like, uh, I can go yeah. on for 16 hours. Um, but basically in order for them to kind of give me the money, we had to make this lab. Uh, so and this lab, uh, in five next five minutes, give us a name. I said, Cultural Trends Lab. <laughs> so we're working on this project. It's you know, very complicated because you know, working in Russia, is there, it's really like working on another planet. And I'm uh, very grateful that my parents immigrated, thank God. Uh, but um, the whole idea is that, so it's Binali, it's only a small part. So the idea of a project, right, the project is called Elsewhere, yeah. is to look at the growth of diffusion of global culture worldwide in the last 30 years and uh, to try to include as much detail as possible. So kind of my idea, uh, which was about 2007, is that today we have so many cultural events, you know, like the seminar, right? Uh, and before, you know, virus, we had movie openings and music, you know, music acts and clubs and lectures in museums and museum openings, you know, and the meetups and so on, that uh, this cultural events has become a new form of big data, right? And I want, so what I wanted to do is collect data on these cultural events, the cultural physical events, mm -hmm. and then track, you know, where these events are taking place, how many more events are taking place today than 10 years ago, and also because every event publishes a text about it, like you can go to eFlux, right? Or you can go to you know some architecture uh, platform and people publish like descriptions and competitions, use kind of computational text analysis and extract keywords and basically see how also global culture develops semantically, right? Uh, and it was very, again, very really funny that I wanted to do it because right at the moment when I kind of wanted to publish, right? The first uh, result from this project, this virus happened. And of course, with things which got completely shut down, are physical cultural events, right? So mm -hmm. the last thing which is going to open in most countries are going to be, you know, theater, opera, uh, museums, and kind of re maybe restaurants, right? So everything else will be open. And so it turns out what the core culture is dependent on interaction. It's a kind of very dangerous thing. Uh, so we collected actually um, uh, data on four and a half million cultural events in 200 countries during about 15 years. Uh, so I'm now kind of working on analysis. And in fact, I'm looking for smart collaborators, uh, which can be in the areas of computer science, design, and so on, because there's so much data, I can't do it all myself. Uh, but the idea, right, was to create the first kind of more inclusive maps of contemporary culture, uh, and to basically figure out the role of smaller cities, the role of smaller countries, and to perhaps counteract this myth but the culture still happens, right, in a handful of global capitals, which got this proportional amount of media attention, and to figure out actually what's going on. So for example, one of the things we're looking at, what's the proportion of these events every year taking place in, a, in, in like two, bigger cities versus everywhere else. And in fact, we do see that proportional events over these 15 years in the smaller cities is really becoming bigger. But um, so what I published so far is just very, very tiny part, like a little test. Um, and uh, as I was kind of writing this blog post, the virus happened. So uh, I decided to right, uh, make a more direct connection. Sorry, I'm just make a more direct connection. So this is, okay, I hear this, sorry. Make a more direct connection uh, to these events. So I'll very briefly show you uh, the results. Uh, here it is. So that's a very small data set. Uh, I was working with my PhD student in our history from CUNY and we decided to create a data set because it doesn't exist, which would list all the art biennials, uh, which had addition in 2017, 2018. So that's important because there are actually many more biennials 
which were established in the last hundred years, but often we establish, we have one edition they disappear. So biennial uh, is not simply another big art exhibition, it's a kind of commitment, right, of a local area to have an event every two or three years. Uh, so it speaks about a certain kind of cultural commitment, right? So this is a map uh, from 1895, right, from the first Biennale in Venice to today. And you can see in the beginning, right, it's mostly Europe, and then in the last uh, 10, 20 years, it really expands to other continents. Mm -hmm. And you can see how like, all the expansion can happen at the end. Um, so this is the growth, right? So the start of one in 1896, they get to uh, 37 by 1990, and then we get to 200 uh, last year, or the year before. So it looks like the growth is exponential. And that's another reason why I say that maybe this crisis was something good about it, because many, many people really complain that we spend all the time traveling, you know, going from event to event, speaking, and, uh, you know, at least our traditional idea of culture, intellectual production, that you need some time in your studio, right? Maybe it's an architecture studio, art studio. And in my case, I need some time in a cafe with my laptop to kind of think, reflect, uh, and not simply react to what's happening today. Because I think that this constant kind of jet setting also had a bad effect on culture and bad effect on architectural education. I remember um, I heard a lecture by, um, I forgot her name, right? But she's a, she's a new president, I think, of Architectural Association, right? I think uh, maybe you know who it is. And she said, well, basically the way, the way I work with our students, we look at all the competition from last three years, who won, and that's all my students study, which is awful, right? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so, uh, uh, so now actually it turns out that the growth was faster in the 90s, so then it became slower. Uh, and uh, there were some interesting trends. So for example, around 2002, Asia overtakes North America, uh, and uh, we can see how still Western Europe dominates, but Asia is kind of taking off. Uh, but uh, let's actually look at the effect of a crisis, right? So this is uh, simply a part of the data from 1970 until now. So in 2000, you have a recession uh, following the kind of dot-com crash in America, but it only happens in developed countries. And uh, it's a bit hard to say what's going on because the data set is very small, right? So this, uh, when we see that things slow down, it's hard to see, it, it hard, it's hard to say that it's actually directly the effect of a economic crisis or simply because it's a random thing, mm -hmm. but it does seem right. It does seem like maybe there's things slow down a little bit in 2000. Mm -hmm. But definitely the next, right, the next recession before this one, which is now entering a new one, right, big one, very really big one, uh, we definitely see a slowdown, right, so things keep going up, mm -hmm. and then you can see uh, uh, we start dropping, and it takes a bit of a time, right, for things to drop. So the number, actually, I haven't mentioned, the number which you see here is how many new BNRs have been established each year, right? So in this year we had three, and this year we had 14. So 40 new biennales, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And then it drops. Uh, and what happens, in fact, uh, what you said is actually not quite correct. Uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's not as good. Uh, as a, Because mm -hmm. first, I, I think maybe you read my post earlier where I had one conclusion. And when I look at the data, more carefully realize things are not so good. Mm -hmm. uh, because what happens is that, yes, between 2009 and 2017, new biennale being added every year, but the rate is slower, right? So between like 2002 and 2008, they're growing much faster. And after 2009, for the next, uh, for the next you know, um, eight, uh, eight years, we also grow, but slower, but we still grow, we still, we still seven new binaries per year, right? right? So maybe it's good news or bad news, it depends, right? If you're optimist or pessimist, but definitely we see the effect. And uh, I also remember seeing this effect, for example, in universities at some point, like uh, we had to pay for our phone and the people didn't hire. And the effect uh, only really started to be, to be felt a couple of years in. So I don't want to be right, like, you know, like I don't want to, you know, kind of predict bad things, but it's possible that this year things are still okay and maybe things will get worse last year. Uh, but uh, I'm finishing. But I think what's also happening, and you're going to ask me about this a bit later, is that certain digitization of culture, which is already going on for decades, yeah. is kind of quickly accelerated, you know, and um, I think we'll talk a bit later where museums and other cultural institutions are using Zoom and uh, websites in a very creative way, 
or we're simply maybe putting that stuff online, but even if we simply put stuff online, it's still okay. Because out of 8 billion people in the world, right, 7.5 billion will never be able to go to Center Pompidou or MoMA. So even if we go and look at museum very boring website, it's actually better than nothing. So in general, digitization is a good thing because it does make culture more democratically accessible. Yeah. So this this leads me to the next yeah. So this leads me to the next question about digitization because when we talk about cancellation of biennales and the digitization of of culture in the age of uh, um, the pandemic, um, if we speak about the effect of, of the COVID nineteen on the cultural landscape, we we do see that you know cultural events are being cancelled or simply moving towards the online version. Whether that is a good thing or a bad thing, I, I wonder. Maybe we can speak a little bit about that because more than often the version of moving online is 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 not satisfying or maybe you can say uninspiring. While it seems that moving online, um, you know, is a natural step of the moment, we're often left to wonder whether, whether you know that should be made by all costs. And I want to read you something that I came across recently. This is from a completely different, you know, this is coming from film, a statement made by the Sheffield Doc First director. Her name is Cynthia Gill. And when she was asked about the plans for this year's festival, um, she was defending the collective experience of cinema. And she said, we would never merely reproduce DocFest online. We don't believe that's the best way to defend the values we want to stand for. We resist the idea that an online presence is more democratic. It's not. The digital, it's proliferation and consumerist prerogatives is a confused world where inequality Differences in access and social codes are very much affirmed. Access is not about an easy click or a marketing campaign. It's about context. And this is why they're not holding also competitions this year. And this position towards art and culture, I think, in, in times of COVID-19 is becoming perhaps more and more dominant now. And I would like to hear, maybe you have some thoughts about the current digitization of cultural events and institutions. You yeah. said it quite pitifully, you know, you know it's, it's better than nothing. But whether this is a documentary film festival or a museum, sure. surely there's something more substantial that needs to be done to be embraced, yeah. rather than giving us a virtual tour of a museum or replicating a whole festival yeah. online. Well, you know, what are many ideas here, so I will try to speak, I will try to kind of do this question a bit briefly because I want to show also some things later. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I think it's impossible to talk today that there's a particular trend because we don't know. I mean, how do you know? You ask every single person, every single, museum, like 50,000 museums, you ask every single curator in China, right. like 35,000, you don't know, right? So there is no trend, we don't know, right? So some people, now, now there are always going to be people today who are going to uh, present digital and online world as a negative world. This is only a very stupidity uh, because, you know, it's very easy to blame everything on Facebook because it's very easy to blame everything on algorithm because algorithms do not defend themselves. And for me, it's a complete hypocrisy Basically, contemporary global culture runs on hypocrisy, right? So mm -hmm. we're all socialists, you know, we're all left, and then we go home to our comfortable bourgeois lives, right? Like I teach at CUNY, which is like full of Marxists, you know, and it's complete hypocrisy, uh, you know, from my point of view. And uh, here's, here, here's why. So 20 years ago, when internet and World Wide Web, right, were, were new to many people, the same leftists, projected completely unrealistic utopian ideas onto the internet. Is the way internet is going to make us more equal, you know, internet is going to lead to more democracy, more you know, horizontal world. And I've never, I've never made these claims. I just was describing what I was seeing, right? New media, and that's why my book is still used and very books are forgotten. And now, and then the same people, very simplistically, so, oh my God, now there's a Facebook and so many people are just using Facebook. You know, and Facebook is a company, and in a very simplistic way, they decided let's blame internet and digital for everything because it's easy, right? So, so it means that these people they're not really looking at reality. They're not looking at millions, at millions of young people who are forming communities and learning photography and art from Instagram. They're not learning at you know again tens of millions of people who are using even art or, or young students in architecture who learn from each other, right? We're not, we're not looking at all the amazing users of social media. We also not, we also, as a typical Western left, we don't respect people. Because Facebook, Instagram are used by 80 million people worldwide mm -hmm. to promote for small businesses, right? To advertise if you're aerobics teacher or you know, graphic designer. 
you know, so why we have to take money and bread away from these people, right? Um, so, um, so I kind of really hate this idiotic, uh, moralistic, hyper hypocritical attacks, uh, because of course, uh, yes, I'm not saying that everything has to be digital. There's obviously something to be said, and uh, the culture is physical, right? Going to festival is not simply watching films, you know, it's having drinks and meeting people and also watching films together. It's very social, but how many people are going to go and, you know, and fly to some festival by taking stay in a hotel, right? Mm -hmm. So the physical culture, it's a very exclusive thing. Yeah? So to me, I believe in a very kind of, I believe basically in a society where we're surrounded by very smart people mm -hmm. are saying the stupidest things, right? Not just Mr. Trump, but everybody around me, right? So uh, we see digital is somehow full of inequality and what, going to, uh, you know, going to a very rich part of London, New York and Paris, dressing up and going to expensive gallery, it's about equality. The art world exists basically to promote soft power by different countries and to satisfy competition between 3,000 rich people who basically compete who buy the same artworks. And what, being artist is somehow better than being designer? So um, sorry, you know, I, 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 you know, I, um, I was going to say it soon later, but I thought that's a good question where I can kind of let my let my let my things down. Yeah. Uh, and um, you know, obviously, you don't have to agree with me, but uh, to me, right, when smart people, educated people, are saying, you know, digital, it's about inequality. In my mm -hmm. film festival, my museum, you know, my exclusive private gallery is about mm -hmm. equality. Come on, guys. I mean, nobody, I, no, no, no AI, no AI, which is trained to be smart, would well, ever take it seriously. Only humans can say such such nonsense. You know? I was kind of predicting that resentment, and I wanted to use it also because yeah. you 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 have this position also uh, against you know co conservative positions towards big data or the problems with how people see big data or your projects about big data because I think it would be fair to say that you are bothered by the fact that at least intellectually big data is not taken seriously. You mentioned earlier that everyone are, you know, think about it from a Marxist position, from an ideologically driven position, uh, and that, you know, its production remains reactionary in the sense that because it's, it's, it stays within the hands of big corporations. And I've heard you saying that um, social sciences is being conducted in, in two places nowadays, right, in academia and also in the capitalist market with big corporations like Google or Amazon. Mm -hmm. and, sure. and, and taking into account that your projects or you know, your, your research projects uh, are part of your suggestion to think about big data in, in, in artistic terms. Um, how do you deal with the fact that you know, the vast information that you gain from the institutions, um, it can tell us a lot about human behavior, but it's still driven mostly by consumerist goals. So I'm kind of playing the devil's advocate of the sure, Marxist sure, position sure. that you mentioned sure. earlier. Sure. Here is sure. Sure. Uh, sure. It was a very good idea to put us together, right? Yeah. Uh, because sometimes, you know, you kind of almost force me to like take a more extreme position. Right. And you're like, annoying in purpose, it's perfect. <laughs> okay, so let me sh share the screen and show a few things, right? Uh, so just a moment. So yeah, I have like, I already prepared, so like I prepared what I'm going to show. Um, so let me just see if I'm going to use this one, right? We are going for this, we are going to just a moment. We have, uh, let me think about which ones we are going to use. Just one, one second, just one second. Let me just see what I'm going to see. Ah, I was going to use this one, right? Uh, okay. Um, right. Um, yeah. So um, in 2009, an article was published in Science, right, which is one of two most prestigious scientific journals. This article was called Becoming Computational Science. And it pointed out that a new kind of paradigm for social research is emerging. And we already had many examples, so it was 11 years ago, which is the use of so-called big data uh, to ask social questions. And at that time, big data was available, uh, first of all, from social media, because you had APIs, you had mechanisms to download it. Now it's not really available because uh, after Cambridge Analytica scandals, you know, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Instagram, right? They kind of closed their APIs, but you can still get API, you can still get big data from our, I would say what I call professional platforms. So you can get uh, data from about 40 million music tracks from Spotify, so you can research music 
using Spotify collection of 40 million songs. Uh, you can get data from uh, Behance, right? Which is, you know, the default site used by kind of all designers in the world. Um, so uh, when we say big data, let's not assume it's only kind of consumer data when people are browsing on Facebook or Twitter, right? Um, you know, people, you know, but scientists also using satellite data and we're also using anonymized phone data, for example, to study tourist behavior. And this was just right some of the fields uh, which, I, which I put in the slide, uh, uh, right? Which existing fields, but also new fields which developed where people are studying contemporary culture using data science. So one point I want to make is that contemporary culture is studied not so much by humanities people, but kind of focus in the past, but it's actually studied in all kinds of different fields. And of course, it's also studied by marketing departments, can see, right? people who do consumer preferences, product development. Um, so in fact, nobody has more data about uh, kind of culture behaviors than the companies. And the problem is not with their companies, you know, right? I mean, I escape communism, so I like, I like shopping, believe me, right? I don't mind consumer capitalism, uh, as long as we can make res responsible consumption, which seems to be very hard. What I do mind is that, uh, you know, we have, we're sitting on this data, right? We have hundreds of thousands of data points per person per day, but of course, we're only going to ask questions which will be connected to product development, sales and marketing. And of course, where data is not accessible, right? So that's one thing I don't like. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want to show very briefly a couple of projects, you know, done by very different institutions, just to show you, right, how people can make interesting projects about big data, which is not, uh, social media data, right? So the fact that, you know, Facebook and Instagram close their API, which is a probably good thing, doesn't mean it's the end of this research. So this is a, a multimedia journalism, which was published by New York Times two years ago. So they uh, downloaded data uh, from Spotify, right? So Spotify has data on like 40 or 50 million songs. So we got the data on all the uh, music, music songs, which were the hits during every summer in America over like 30 years. And then right, every song becomes the shape and the kind of five, five dimensional, five dimensions, five different features, right? And then you can uh, plot these shapes for every, right, every year. And, you, and basically what we looked at is the diversity of uh, songs within one season. Is it increasing or is it decreasing, right? Mm -hmm. And they basically pointed out that uh, as we go from 87 to 2012, every summer the hits are becoming, right, more and more similar. And to mm -hmm. me, this is exactly the kind of research I think are most fascinating because we can look at like long-term cultural trends and instead of, you know, going right to you know, a bar or cafe and having tea and just wandering around, did the globalization make the culture, you know, more homogeneous or not, right? Ta -ta -ta. At least in some cases, we can now have hard evidence, right? Uh, and then that's another example. Again, this is not for me. As you know, I have my own work, but I want to show other people. So this is from a very famous lab at um, East Coast in America, Northeastern University by Mr. Burabashi, uh, who's a Hungarian Jew. And uh, he's one of the most influential scientists in network science. Uh, so we got hold of a database, which has, um, uh, you know, which is again, not social media database. It's a database of about 450,000 artists, almost half a million artists and at least all the exhibitions. And you can do this research yourself. For example, you can go to LinkedIn, you can download CVs of all the architects, all architectural students, and you can study architectural careers. So what we found out in this research is that something very counterintuitive because normally you think that you start as an artist, you have exhibition in some kind of private places, maybe at your home, maybe in some non-profit places, some municipal place, and then eventually you go to Gagosian, right? Uh, Etc. But in reality, we found out that if you, if artists, their first exhibitions on this kind of what we call low prestige places, most of them stay in this low prestige kind of uh, part of the market. And uh, and if people start in a kind of very high prestige gallery, most of them stay in high prestige and there's very small crossover. So here we're using uh, career data, right? About half a million artists uh, to look at patterns of artistic careers. Uh, so I think, you know, I'm, I was going to show my thing, but you know, my thing, so I think that's enough. Um, so- um, I want to maybe to ask- yeah, yeah, because... Basically to summarize, you're absolutely right, right? So nobody has more data about mm -hmm. uh, cultural behaviors, mm -hmm. especially behavior online on companies. And lots of this data is available, 
But I think that's a good thing. So now we're pushed to be more creative and to kind of do research into culture using this big data idea and also look at other areas such as professional culture, for example. Yeah. What you showed is is is, is bringing me to the to to the uh, uh, idea of AI aesthetics and the, the article that you wrote, and you spoke a little bit about the issue that seems to be the central issue there in in, in your book, is, and it's AI diversity, where you know where AI enters our cultural life, it can automate the process of creation, the, the process of aesthetic creation, whether this is the explore option in in you know in Instagram or. Uh, ways in which photo apps can uh, uh, modify our photos or even like you said now music recommendations so our, our aesthetic decisions are being gradually automated but you say several times in, in in your piece there you know we should not be mistaken there is a human component at the end of the process that makes those decisions um, even when you speak about an ai made movie trailer for example but the big question for you is and wondering if you can say a few words about that. How can we, how far can we trust uh, computers for automatically generating those cultural artifacts uh, right. within those artistic decisions? Right. Um, so, okay, let me share a screen, but I will just show a few things very briefly because I'm, I'm, you know, I can see the time and we want to have time for discussion. So it'll be very, very brief, I promise. Uh, so just a moment. Sorry, I'm juggling between. Okay, no, it's not this one, it's this one, yes. Okay, um, so uh, just a moment. Right. Um, so, um, so to go back, right, and to think about algorithms and AI being used mm -hmm. in art, so it was already a kind of small art movement beginning in the late 50s and the early 60s. So I'm showing you some really early uh, computer art from the fact 70s. And Harold Coyne was the first artist. He was invited to stand for the AI lab in 71, 72. And then he stayed in California and um, he was kind of supposed to the first artist who worked with AI. And I'd like to show his work because he uh, became professor at the University of California, San Diego. And he was teaching with AI, digital art for 20 years. Of course, his painter colleagues hated him. And then he hired another person and then this person hired me. So I basically became professor in 96 in the same department and I experienced our first five, 10 years, the same resentment from my kind of art history, art, video, film colleagues, because we're afraid of new media. Well, you know, they were right to afraid because, you know, new media ate, ate them, right? Anyway, so I think what happens in, uh, in the late uh, 2000 and in the last decade is that AI is now no longer something which is, which is experimental with by a small group of artists, but it becomes, as you said, a kind of engine of contemporary culture. Right. And here's just some examples, right? So I'm using a phone, this is Huawei phone, I'm using Chinese phone because it's a better one. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, already we built a function, so when you kind of carry around your phone, the camera is constantly looking what's in front of it, and it's running like a little neural network. So it recognizes uh, the type of object, the type of scene. So when you take, uh, when you take a picture, it automatically adjusts exposure to give you, you know, a best photograph. Uh, another thing which happened already up in 2014, so in addition to recognizing, right, a type of objects and the type of scenes, the AI is now can recognize uh, photographic properties such as selective focus, and also it can give images an aesthetic score. And as we discussed before, right, before starting, that's very problematic because when you actually go into, you know, Tel Aviv, right, or anywhere, you see that there are different subcultures or at least various styles, right? So some people wear only black because we think it's in New York and people wear New York, black in New York because they're lazy, right? In Korea, there is different style and this red with minimalism, there is, you know, there is maximalism. So in fact, people do enjoy different things. So it's very strange to evaluate any photograph from a point of view of a single aesthetic system. And uh, what I was writing in my book is I'm kind of a bit worried about the systems because in fact, they can push uh, people and people taste through a certain aesthetic homogeneity. Mm -hmm. uh, partly because Instagram, right, it's like one world system. So everybody looking at the same photographs. And uh, this photograph, which a computer gave a score of 85%, I, I know why, because I'm a professor of computer science, uh, right, because it basically fulfills the requirements for like, a good photograph. But from, from our point of view, it's actually a bad photograph because it's a complete cliche. Right? Because we don't take into account our dimensions such as originality, memorability, uniqueness. Mm 
uh, you know, and then uh, it goes on and on, right? So this is a now a popular photo editing software which uses the AI to automatically enhance your photos, right? And of course, you know, billions of people using uh, using uh, face editing apps which do the same. And of course, right? You'll never now see faces of wrinkles, right? In bloggers, in video tubes, everybody is going to look perfect. And maybe this perfection is going to be a particular kind of right Caucasian face or Caucasian face with a bit of like an Asian. I mean, I think still, as I travel around the world, I think the standards of beauty are very different, uh, but there is definitely a certain drive towards uh, homogeneity. Right. And AI is not AI is not the only right force, right? I mean, I think there are many other forces, right? Uh, but I think AI potentially yeah. can contribute to it. Uh, but what I'm really interested, right, is not to say yes to doing it or not, but to be able to measure right, kind of cultural reliability using big data. And then of course, the interesting question, how do you measure cultural reliability, right? Right. How do you measure if uh, the buildings in a particular city are more diverse or not? And that's what's really interesting about it, right? So what's really interesting is maybe not to figure out is AI, computers, travel, internet, blah, 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 is making the world more homogeneous. It's kind of hard to say because there's always going to be counter examples, but, but this idea that we can measure originality, diversity, reliability, in architecture, in design, in photography, in fashion, and food. So that, to me, it's an interesting idea as a kind of theorist. So, so in, in that sense, um, if we speak about conservatism and um, homogeneity, um, another thing that you're bothered by with AI, with artificial intelligence, is what you call the conservative tendency, that, that people accept the fact that AI can only simulate historical art, while AI, for, in your opinion, can, can, can actually execute the main strategy of modern art and that is to constantly expand what counts as art and right. and you show that even the uses of machine learning uh and deep neural networks like like gun is not more advanced than earlier uses of ai and even more restrictive um since again the human being makes a decision along the way but i think that the issue of systematic style is interesting here in relation to what you were just saying because you know you can use ai to decide if we take it towards film studies, whether a film belongs to what Boardwell and Thompson and Steiger called, you know, uh, um, uh, the, the classical Hollywood film. cinema. Yeah, classical Hollywood cinema, exactly. Yes. Yeah. But, well, but, then, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but then again, well, yeah. you know, do we, do we really need to force computers to, to create like us? Do we need to teach computers to do things like we do? Can we think about it in a more expanded way than sort of to break away from those traditions, to break away from those styles? Sorry for interrupting. I just wanted to complete. No, no, no. Sorry, I'm sorry, but you know, I got so excited because you probably were the person, uh, at least person who told me who read this article and actually picked up on I think what was most interesting idea, where, which I didn't really develop. That yes, AI can be used to generate art, but we can also generate art ourselves. You know, we have too many artists anyway. Yeah. Uh, but can we use AI as a kind of like a theorist to try to understand, uh, you know, the structures of, you know, right, films, architecture, and so on. So first of all, to restate what you were saying, right? Uh, so the problem with this AI art or digital art is that in our society, in our culture, right, uh, you know, people have this very strange ideas about art. I actually want to investigate it also using big data. So the idea is somebody who makes an image is an automatic an artist. So right. always people, right, who never did anything artistically, mm -hmm. you go on a computer, you go to this website, right? You take a photograph of Big Ben, and when you take a painting, like a one on one go paintings, and you press a button, or maybe you write some code, but you don't even understand how the code works because well, you know, it was developed by somebody else. And when you have producers, right, this image, which is kind of fun because it's a photograph in the style of Van Gogh and now you're an artist. <laughs> so there are probably millions and millions of these people and uh, you know, it's a bit of a problem uh, and because it's so easy, right? I think for me, AI art, when I think about it, like I kind of, I can have a bad feeling uh, because actually if you want to draw, if you want to, I don't know, if you want to make a pizza, if you want to figure out how to put makeup, you actually have to learn, right? So to me, like millions of women and many men in Asia who put makeup every day and spend half an hour, we're actual artists, right? And they actually make your face look beautiful. That's art. This is not art because that's too easy. And uh, what I want to point out is that when I showed this uh, uh, images of early computer art, 
I said, well, maybe this image is somewhat interesting uh, because people had to write the software. So we wrote everything from scratch. We had to understand how it works. And also, you know, these people had very little time of computer. So mm -hmm. these artists would actually spend most of the time at home developing their systems, making sketches. And then maybe like one day we'll be able to go to the computer center at night and plot these images. And also the teachers came from Bauhaus, right? So there is a kind of concepts here, um, you know, which we develop. And uh, I think the problem, right, is within contemporary kind of popular culture, many people confuse images with art, right? So something which image or something which looks like modern painting becomes art, right? So that's why we always use Van Gogh and similar painters. Um, I don't know if we can talk about this idea uh, of AI kind of creating some kind of non-human art uh, because I don't have any illustrations, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but basically very briefly, uh, I will just introduce it maybe like literally like in one, in one, uh, yeah, I will introduce it like in one, uh, in one second. Uh, so what I started to wonder, maybe we never, maybe, oh, sorry, 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 it's the wrong one. Maybe we never had, maybe we never had art which was not algorithmic. Maybe all this art was kind of digital and algorithmic. Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so for example, right, we have linear perspective, right, which was reinvented in Renaissance. And to make linear perspective, you can follow algorithm. Maybe this algorithm was built in the 3D computer graphics in the 60s. Ornament, right, which is probably 60 to 70 percent of all traditional ancient art. You know, basically, there is a system and things are repeating, right? And when you need to look at the modern art, well, it's a kind of ornament, right? Yeah. Yes, you know, one, you know, yes, we have this myth about Jackson Pollock, who is like, right, doesn't think, you know, and delusional and, you know, and runs around with, you know, with oil, but basically, he creates, right? He creates, you know, a kind of ornament because, in fact, every part of his image is very similar to every other part. So it's very systematic. Right. And then you have another painter, which is Russian Florensky, like a Russian Jackson Pollock working in the 20s, 30s. You know, and he would start in a corner of one painting, and then by the time he got to the end, he was finished. And again, he kind of covers, the, you know, almost like a mad, mad artist, right? He covers the surface in his particular style, uh, and everything now looks within the same system. So my point is that, in fact, it's very, very hard to find artifacts in the history of human culture which are non-systematic, right? Mm -hmm. For example, imagine where, uh, uh, where you know, Pollock would start in one style, and then end up with complete realism, right? Or let's say Pollock, or let's say somebody starts like Van Gogh, and then ends up like Picasso. Well, basically, yeah, people start doing it in the 80s, we call it postmodernism, but it's kind of like exception. And the question is why? And uh, what I'm wondering, maybe it has to do with the fact that, you know, people are always making images, dresses, you know, architecture by hand, Mm -hmm. And we have some kind of, we have some signature, right? We have some predictability kind of behaviors built into our body. Mm -hmm. uh, this is research from like 10 years ago where we showed computer videos of people walking. And after just seeing like literally a few seconds of people walking, we're able to identify these people in the next video almost 100% accuracy, right. right? So it's very hard for me to walk in different ways. It's very hard for me to talk without using my strange mannerism without touching my glasses. So maybe we will listen art it keeps repeating and our art is so systematic and algorithmic is because the same thing. And what I said, maybe a computer can help us to leave the systematicity and predictability of the human body and this, uh, this constant repetitions we seem to be repeating. Wonderful. Uh, this, you know, talking about the systematics of art leads me to your other um, interest and that is with Instagram. Um, I'm, 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 I hope that you'll find that we're moving kind of across different fields that you're... Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, I will try to also because you know, I'm looking at time, so I will try to... I, I will yeah, we have, uh, I think we have time for two more questions and then we'll open yeah, yeah, up. I will try to answer more briefly because also I'm always interested in inter interaction, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, I find with Zoom format somehow, you know, people are able to, people somehow like... Yeah. You know, you know, we normally give a lecture, people sit in the back and they're afraid to ask questions. Sure, everybody in front, so to speak, right? So I think potentially it's more democratic. Yeah, so go ahead. And this is a good time to say it for the audience that if you have a question, please write it down with the Q&A tab. This is, you know, how the system works and we can read the question and Professor Manovich can answer. Okay. So being, you know, a, a visual digital culture scholar, you, you, you're interested in, in Instagram and, and you wrote the book Instagram and Contemporary Image in 20, uh, 2017, um, uh, in which you, think, you were thinking about Instagram as a site, not only for delivering in, information, but also as a site for aesthetics. Um, and then again, 
you know, being a, the platform, being corporate led, I'm sure that you've heard this counter argument, you know, many times um, that it's no more than it's ideologically driven platform and being so, can it be in any way radical or, or innovative? So I'm, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about, you know, forms of communication and art making nowadays in terms of their radical potential vis-a-vis um, yeah. -vis their inevitable link to commercial sure. culture. Yeah. So I think there are two questions here, so I'll try to answer both, but yes, like very, very organized. Yeah. One is about the kind of potential of Instagram, right? And can you have like interesting thing on in Instagram? The answer is of course you can, mm -hmm. because you have hundred one billion people using it. So when I started looking at Instagram and we kind of between 2012, 2016, we downloaded 17 billion images. Uh, no, sorry, so 17 million images from 16 cities. Mm -hmm. And what I find, yeah, I mean, basically, yeah, there are people using commercial at the time, but just a few. Maybe now there are more, but major, for majority of people, it's like vernacular photography, right? It's homemade photography, like before you photograph your family going on vacation, now you photograph your burger, your shoes. You know, it's basically used by normal people who use it uh, to record moments of their life and to show them to, you know, to their friends, family, and so on. Yeah, and then, you know, there are various kind of, let's say, style or cultural communities you know, there are, you know, there are, right, there are millions of communities by different hashtags. You know, there are, for example, right, there are various, uh, you know, and the community, but I mean the community, you take photograph and you put a tag and then it becomes part of this community, right? So, uh, okay. so the communities are created by hashtags, right? And you can actually find, you can find anything you want. You can find minimalism, you can find white and white, you can find, you know, classical photography, you can find, uh, you know, 50 shades of gray, you can find people who, uh, uh, people who kind of use hashtag to photograph certain mood you experience in kind of post-communist, post-Soviet cities. So in fact, it's the largest visual encyclopedia, right, of our lives. Uh, and uh, so while the majority of people use it, right, as a continuation of kind of home photography, kind of code photography of 20th century, which means that there are certain unwritten rules what you photograph and how you photograph it. So for example, portraits are still kind of straight and people try to make horizon line straight, as opposed to the way like avant-garde, watching Kalisitsky be making the angle. I mean, you also find every possible community there. And also, uh, again, to me, it's a bit of a, sorry to say, not, not about, not against you, but to me, it's a very hypocritical statement to say, well, you know, Instagram is a, is a, is a platform, uh, it's a company, so can we find something creative? You know, there are only like so many countries which have good universities, good museums, art funding, so how do people do culture, art, and, and ideas in other countries? We do it on Facebook. Right. In Russia, if you take away Facebook, you know, people are going to cry. So while in America, let's say, people think of Google, right, as something bad, in China, right, it's, it will be a sign of democracy and freedom. So in many, in many countries, the whole video art exists on YouTube. So I think, again, from my point of view, it's a bit hypocritical to criticize these platforms without thinking how we use globally, where um, in many, many countries, it's like the only way to do it. And also again, like, you know, I'm basically very active, right? I've always follow like many Russian uh, friends and uh, on, uh, you know, on Facebook in Russia. In Russia, it's used as the medium of intellectual change. People have discussions. Many Russian uh, young creators, but young creator can be like a model, right? A mo you know, model is not a model. So she posts pictures of herself, and then she writes like three page, text on Instagram, so you can also use it as a literary medium, okay? Uh, so, as, as you know, right, part of my part of my work is, again, this almost moralistic, right, my own moralistic agenda is try to kind of try to show to people, try to expose this variety, but maybe I haven't done a good enough job. Uh, and then the second question was about innovation. Innovation, yeah. And maybe yeah. you could also say if things have changed for the past three years since you wrote the book, of course. It's yeah, no, things changed, change, of course. No, of course, Instagram became more commercial, but mm -hmm. what is the percentage, right, of these more commercial images? Is it like 1%, 5%, 2%? Mm -hmm. I don't know because the API is closed. Um, but, uh, but here's what I want to say, right? So when we started with research in 2012, mm -hmm. Instagram was not really commercial yet, right? So Facebook only bought in 2013. And by 30 million, 30 million people. So when it became more commercial, they did stories and this and that, right? But now there's 1 billion people. So it's possible that with commercial images is only, right, very small percentage. Uh, 
The right. second thing is that, so when we're talking about innovation, mm -hmm. I just want to say something very briefly. So, you know, I have this thesis, uh, which is in my article, Avant-Garde Software from 99, which I was going to develop into a book, but I never did it. So I promise I will do it. And here how it goes. So if you look at kind of modernism and modernist revolution, art, architecture, design, cinema, and so on, literature, it's really about inventing new forms, like Le Corbusier, Gropius, and so on, Melnikov. It's also inventing kind of new filters, new ways to look at the world, you know, cubism, surrealism, and so on, and also inventing new ways to represent subjectivity. Mm -hmm. So it's basically new ways to create things in the world, and it's new ways to represent things in the world, and new, way, and new way, ways, right? And then you can talk about innovation, or stream mm -hmm. of consciousness. Uh, I don't know, a novel by Nabokov, where Nabokov right. suddenly, when, when one sentence goes from here to, from Tel Aviv to Paris. Well, to me, the spirit of innovation ends around 1970. So it's about 100 years, right? 100, 18, 1870, 1970. And then this kind of modernism, uh, questioning the accepted things, it goes into fashion. So it begins in fashion in the 1980s with Japanese and Belgians. And then it goes into architecture, right? Uh, partly because of blobs, right? Partly because architects are using software which doesn't have doors. And then uh, in the late 2000s, uh, there is a kind of food revolution, right? So, uh, and the journalism, journalism is still pre-modernist, right? When I talk about journalists, maybe you should write experimental journalism, we don't get it, right? So, um, so I think that, um, you know, uh, this kind of innovation goes into our areas. Mm -hmm. But again, to me, right, all this happened between 90, between like between 93 and 2008, and 2009. And right now, I don't know, I don't know where to look at innovation. The only places where I do look, where things happen all the time, which is it's science, science and technology. So it happened, but in the most specialized field, right? Uh, and I think culturally, in terms of digital media, it's a kind of very uh, conservative period. It's not just about Instagram, but think about Facebook, right? Facebook didn't really change fundamentally in 10 years. Twitter mm -hmm. didn't change mm -hmm. because now you have billions of people using them. Mm -hmm. So it becomes like TV, right? So it's very hard to use them. But it doesn't mean, but so where's innovation? So innovation to me comes in scale. You know, when, 30 million, when 10 million people use a platform, it does one thing. When 1 billion people use platform mm -hmm. and 1 billion people are looking at it, there's all kinds of knowledge transfer, aesthetic transfer, community making, which is going on. So in fact, the developing world, you know, people in Africa, Latin America and so on, they actually only started to actually use social media after 2012. I know what research we have done and, uh, so what I want to say to conclude, yeah, Instagram maybe didn't change in years and Facebook. In fact, people share photographs, which look the same as photographs from 1960, but maybe they're more pretty, right? More saturated. And in fact, you know, right, most of our culture is 20th century, right? Besides kind of games, interactivity, but the function of this culture can change. The culture can reach so many more people, mm -hmm. right? So many more people worldwide have access to museums, to digital tools, to photographic tools. Mm -hmm. I can share the image, I can send the image, I can filter the image. So while the forms remain the same, the innovation is taking place in terms of interactivity, uh, scale, social network, and so on, but not on the level of forms. So that's why I think we don't really see some radical new visual language of photography, or even radical new language of architecture, because I think what happened, what, because I think we're kind of revolution of our time, right? It's not about the forms, it's about how these forms can be used, including data visualization and data science, where for example, right, I can basically take a movie from, from 1896 and I can enhance it and I can make it in 4K resolution. So, uh, so basically, so sorry, it's a bit of a complicated, complicated answer, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but that's the thing. So I think revolution is going on, uh, but it's happening like in a different realm and it's kind of hard for us to recognize it because historically we think of cultural revolution in terms of reforms, New forms of architecture, you know, Baroque, Renaissance, and so on. And now the forms are the same, but something else is happening to accessibility, scale, networking, and so forth. So what I take from your answer is that innovation lies with the new modes of interactivity, regardless of you know what the platform is, and of course the application of science that seems to be now uh, what interests. Well, well, or the science itself. I mean, why not say that contemporary artists are biologists, right? Mm -hmm. Before mm -hmm. artists represent the, represent the human beings. Now we can redesign human beings. Maybe contemporary artists can be artificial intelligence, computer scientists, right? Why do people want to go art school? What do we have to do art? 
just because people go to art school and get diploma, what makes them artists? Right? Maybe it's illusion. You know, I think it's an illusion, right? We learned how to write text to fit the art world. You know, just because you go to art school, but the content of art school is so different from 50 years ago. You know, yeah, it's called art, but actually it's completely, it's a different phenomenon, you know? Uh, so why do you call people who uh, go to art school artists or make people who make images? Why not think of, you know, uh, ma you know, people who give you amazing massage, right? Who learn about how to touch your body, they're artists, right? Why not think of crafts craftspeople as artists today, right? Mm -hmm. Or engineers, why not? Mm -hmm. I, I want to bring you back to cinema, but we have one question from the audience that I want you to respond. Um, um, Aneta is asking, can we use the initial intent, like passing emotion, feeling, VRMS aesthetic to define art? I'm not sure that I understand that completely. Do you understand? Yeah, that? Also, no, sorry, but I also don't understand that feeling VRMS aesthetic. Um, I'm not sure that I do. Um, yeah. Sorry, um, okay, sorry, yeah. Okay, let me go to the next one. So, um, future in the field, will cinema perish? Well, you know, I wish, I wish, um, uh, okay. So, you no, know, um, so cinema has been around, right, for about 130 years. Uh, in the 90s, we were very optimistic Mm -hmm. uh, because 90s to me was a bit like 1920s, and we kind of thought that this new media would take over the world. Surely nobody's going to write novels. Surely nobody's going to make films. Surely nobody's going to publish academic journals. And yet, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, 20th century cultural forms, the 20th century cultural institutions, book publishing, cinema distribution, they turn out to be so strong, we can eat new media, right? So, uh, today, right, more films produced than ever. There's also very interesting television, right? Netflix and so on. Uh, so cinema is not going away. Uh, there is some uh, changes in uh, in uh, how films are made, right? So so you have kind of green screen, blue screen, but now uh, you have a different different system where you can actually have like a very high resolution screen and project the image, so you don't need blue screen and so on. Um, and uh, again, there is a kind of change in scale. So now millions of people make films, good or bad. So I think it's impossible to keep track of world cinema anymore, right? Uh, because you, know, you can't just go to festivals. So again, the new problem is with how do you even like, look at world cinema? Uh, so it's not going to go away. But I think one thing which happened, which is very interesting, and I was going to show you some video, but there's no time, is I haven't looked at video games in like 15 years. And this month I started to look at video games, and I was like, oh my God. Because, yeah, the plots are the same, you have to shoot somebody, your strategy, ta, ta, ta. but the worlds we create, they're so cinematic, they're so realistic, and there's a new genre, right, of video game called open world game, yeah. right, so it's partly algorithmic, where you can basically run around the world, so I think already in the 90s, with kind of digital effects, right, certain films started to come out, where showing you a fantastical kind of world, like Hobbit and blah, 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 blah Jurassic Park, become really as important as narrative. So not just database versus narrative, but narrative versus space exploration. Right. And I think with video games, mm -hmm. the space exploration, this kind of new modality became even more important. And what's interesting is the game players and game reviews, they talk about it, right? So people, so video games, while on some level it's all about shooting, so it's very idiotic. Why not make serious films and video games? Why not make, you know, uh, War and Peace, right? <laughs> or James Joyce. Uh, but in terms of world building, I think we're very, very interesting. And to that, to that extent, the films and video games are almost like moving in the same direction, right? But I'm still waiting for more people to take 3D, to take game engines, to take Unreal, and start making something for like adults. And uh, there is this movement of like independent artistic video games. But for more of these games being created uh, 15 years ago. And this is one thing I want to mention. This is actually my biggest worry about the crisis. Mm -hmm. Because what I noticed, again, it's my own opinion, after 2008, 2009 crisis, one day I went to sleep and the culture was kind of experimental, data visualization, digital art, you know, new media, this and that. And when I woke up, the culture became more commercial because many places closed, many people can got job in companies. You know, mm -hmm. And I think in this time of crisis, uh, it was a commercial change. I feel it very personally and I'm very much afraid that the same thing will happen. So while, while the technology is getting more and more amazing, I, I, I don't think we're going to get new Godard or Tarkovsky, uh, who'll be working in Unreal. Unless you do it, right? It's every you, nobody else. 
Um, Let, let's take this towards, you know, when we spoke about world making and games and the future of cinema, which is something that I prefer to speak of rather than speaking about the death of cinema. But this, yeah, yeah. No you death. know, no death. This, this, otherwise we would have invited Peter Greenway, but in, we invited you. But uh, I would like to take you back to, to an essay. Well, the difference between Peter Greenway and me, like I, I, met, I met him, I was here, like I actually tried to look at you, Peter Greenway, he, can, he only talks, he can, he's, he's a genius, but he can looks like this always, he, he only talks to the God. You know? So it's a bit of a problem, but anyway. But Peter Greenway, Peter Greenway tried to do amazing things, right? With his, you know, with his suitcases project, right? He tried. Yes. But I actually think, with, I think, with, I think the Dow project from Russia is maybe more interesting, right? So I haven't seen Dow yet, but you know, Dow, we made 800, hours, right? Mm -hmm. So that may be interesting with from Russia, we actually try to make something different, right? So once again, you are upset the question of scale. So I'm still waiting for somebody to make a film, which has a million hours of film, and then you need a new interface to watch it. Um, you know, so uh, uh, and a film which would have like 10, 10 million characters, like everybody, everybody in uh, Israel will be a character, like a simulation. Uh, so the question of scale is very interesting, right? Like we have many films which are now like 15 seconds, like you talk, but the only film which is very really long now is the Russian Dow, actually. Sorry, anyway. So I've been wanting to 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 uh, ask you that question for a long time because you, you wrote this essay, What is Digital Cinema? that I use a lot in my intro to digital cinema. What is digital cinema? <laughs> what is digital cinema? Yeah, which I, exactly. I love the title and I think that you make quite a controversial answer there that was, I think, very groundbreaking in 1995 where you say, you know, cinema can no longer be distinguished from animation. It's no, no, no longer an indexical media technology, but rather a subgenre of painting. And, you know, I use it quite a lot. I think when it is used quite a lot to kind of re-legitimize the field of animation and animation studies. Um, but the idea that cinema is, is sort of, um, that, you know, it, it, it pushed animation to the boundary and then it becomes a particular form of, of animation at the end. It's quite, it's quite radical to argue that because you've been dealing a lot with, with computer science and software, but the question kind of lingers today, is cinema still in your opinion, no longer primarily at least, the art of the index? Do you really think that Kino Brush, as you called it, is the primary method of, of cinema? And this relates to game studies, of course, in world okay. So I wrote, so you know, I wrote this uh, article because I was actually sitting, at, I spent one year as a, uh, in Los Angeles in 95 was kind of like a moment when uh, LA started to adapt uh, digital. So I remember when I first came, you go to this panel and people like, no, 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 35 meter film, it's so beautiful, you know. And then, like, and then a few months later, we're like, no, digital, because we realized if we don't play digital, we will be out of a job, right? So I saw it. So the reason, like, again, the reason I write this essay, which is you say predict future, because I, I put myself in the right places at the right time, right? Mm -hmm. So in LA, like in 95 was visible. So I think what happened is not exactly what I predicted, right? Because what I thought is that more films will use uh, the fact that you can kind of do this post production, right, in the computer, sure. and uh, you can do this Photoshop manipulations. In fact, the After Effects uh, only uh, kind of motion graphics started to come out in 96. But after effects already existed, flame and so on. And it kind of happened, right? So I think today, right, you have maybe uh, kind of three genres, right, of films in terms of a skin brush. So you have this completely realistic stuff. You just like TikTok, you just shoot it, right? You don't do anything, so no manipulation. Okay, then you have like maybe more films where you do color correction, right? Color, I mean, you do color grading, you do the different things, which of course you were doing it before. So that's not so different from 1970, uh, but because you can do it in a computer, right? You can be more precise uh, and uh, you can also like improve things, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a bit like a bit like a kind of beautification, right? Beautification right. and uh, so and when you have a third general films, right? Which are really kind of mostly everything is computer generated and uh, you, you don't know it, but there are these fantastical worlds and sometimes these fantastical worlds are very realistic simply some crowd in the background, and sometimes it can be used to recreate new kind of spaces. Um, uh, so I think that this, uh, so the, the Kampkina brush, it did become bigger, it didn't take over, right? But it did become bigger. Uh, so I think in my 95 article, just to make my point, I kind of had to exaggerate, mm -hmm. uh, but I think I was right, but what happened is this, I was kind of hoping, right? Because 90s was very optimistic, avant-garde decade, I was hoping that 
this transformation of cinema technology will lead more people to make films which are less realistic, uh, right? Maybe develop different styles, uh, more interesting spaces, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but instead, what happened is these tools are used, right? But we basically used to make, you know, narrative films or kind of these big blast of films, and some is big, big, you know, big budget films are very wonderful, right? And uh, some are not. Uh, so while the technology is here, we, we kind of live in conservative cultural times, right? Mm -hmm. To a certain extent. Interesting. Uh, so you wrote yeah. this article as, as a manifesto. So, and here's the thing, right? If, if our society would develop in different ways, we would have most amazing innovation today, like in 1925 or 1917, right? So imagine if you give computer to Malevich, right? right. Or to Eisenstein. Right. But we live in this kind of interesting time, right? Where, yeah, there's lots of change, urbanization, uh, changes in education, digitization, and there's lots of good quality commercial culture being done. There's nothing wrong, right, with like Netflix. But in terms of a kind of certain cultural forms, there's some innovation, but mostly, we don't change at all, right? It's like, it's where we enter some classicism period, you know, the moment we enter this period of classicism, right? Um, and again, you know, I, I only watch so, you know, very few films. I mean, see lots of, but you know, I, I see like lots and lots of like good European films, small films, you know, lots and lots of stuff. But in terms of like, you know, kind of like box office, uh, you know, very beautiful, uh, but they're not particularly kind of groundbreaking, right? And, uh, and maybe it had to do a fact that the market has become global, so now you make a movie, right? You spend $200 million just as a game. Right. And you want this to be viewed around the world. So you want it to be liked by like, you know, Chinese housewife and Chinese academic, right? And American housewives and liberal professor in Israel. So you kind of make it safe, right? Uh, so it's hard, hard, but, but you're, you're, you're a film scholar, so you can tell me if I'm wrong. That's my feeling. Uh, professor Manovich, there, uh... I want you to answer uh, Ido Rosen's question. Ido is writing to us, I believe, from, from Cambridge. Hi, Ido. Um, okay. He's wondering, what is your opinion about Netflix homepage? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Homepage, the automation of film curation and the use of algorithm for programming. And also, do you feel the same about computerized editing of news sites? So this is a very big question because um, one of the areas, right, where AI and automation has been entering culture right. is recommendation, right? So Netflix uh, is claims that like something like seventy percent of its views come from its recommendations. I personally never found them useful, but I do like recommendations, for example, on YouTube, and I do like recommendations on Amazon. There was a study done in two thousand ten, quantitative study, which kind of showed that uh, user recommendation YouTube does expose people to more different content, but if not. So again, let's not assume that recommendations always add a homogeneity, uh, because I am in computer science, right? I follow with like a huge body of research in computer science. You know, computer scientists are very smart people, right? Where average IQ is much higher than artists, right? So when humanities people look down at them, it's kind of a bit funny. So, you know, they understand that people don't want to see whatever stuff is so before. So there's lots of work in recommendation systems to try to figure out how to show to people things which are they're going to like, but also which are a bit different from what we like before, right? And there's all kinds of algorithms. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's very hard to study quantitatively because we can change multiple times a day. So in 2010, uh, the scientists figure out that YouTube recommendations lead to more diversity, and, to, and then the next day it can be different. So that's one thing, right? Um, uh, but I want to say just one thing. So what's interesting about recommendations, right, is that, uh, uh, right, so we use many signals, we use many inputs, including you can browse in history your profile. And what's interesting and what's kind of innovative, you ask me where innovation comes from, recommendation engines, Google. What's interesting about the systems is that they don't put you in some pre-existing category. Okay, like housewife, you know, student. No, we simply look at the 200 inputs and they construct recommendations just for you. So we don't have any categories. So in a way you can say it's a very kind of right, potential, it's a very radical presentation of humanity where every person represented as a kind of unique history, right? A unique set of data points. The recommendations are constructed just for you. Now, maybe if you analyze it, you actually find there are categories, but 
but mathematically there are no categories where, right? Mm -hmm. So again, uh, theoretically this technology is amazing, even if it's used in very banal ways, right? Because there is a kind of new model of representation because in arts, we use categories, right? We saw this film was documentary, this film was not. Right. Why? Why, right? Mm -hmm. Now, automatic news editing. Okay, so this is another thing which is a bit, it's a bit different. So here you have uh, many newspapers, uh, already maybe five years ago, uh, I guess starting in New York Times, who started to use in-house software, which would analyze, you know, like all the click rates, you know, what people are looking at, et cetera, et cetera. It would give editors a list of suggested topics to write about. Say, in the next hour, it would be really good to write about this. Now, New York Times, of course, it's not going to tell you how exactly it is the system, and mm -hmm. to what extent, right, to what extent we follow it, but this already been around for a few years. Mm -hmm. We were at a conference in digital journalism, so you can look probably papers and find out. Uh, but in general, uh, because we're close to the end, let me say that, yes, the news are important, but we say, Lev, what is the single biggest evil in the world? I would say news. No? Uh, because we create, you know, this kind of like parallel worldview, where some things are very important, some things don't appear at all, and they create these myths, like for example, this whole myth about AI taking over jobs, right? I mean, no educated person could believe it, right? It's just a program, but it's amazing how news has been spinning and spinning it, and then people start using it, right? Uh, to scare people and uh, to do all kinds of other things, right? Um, so the news, yeah, the news is important, but maybe it's better if it didn't exist. Maybe we need something else, right? Uh, and of course, the problem is that, you know, where dream, right? Where advertising has been falling, so we're, dry, we're driven by sort of, uh, by clicks anyway. And uh, I think there's a tendency, right? In many news or our kind of so-called news portals, which are completely automatic, basically which create like web pages of news, which is automatically, right? taking from somewhere else. Look, you can have a blog, you can have your own blog, and you can use any kind of software, which will automatically say, okay, like we're basically following here's two million stories. So tell us what you want to be featured on your blog and we automatically populate your blog with the content. So lots of these kind of blogs you see, no human even edits it, it's all done automatically. And I think it does create certain effects uh, where certain stories can go to the top, and fake news do spread more faster. And uh, I think this virus perhaps you know, is a good example uh, because virus is very, very important, but for a couple of months, everything else was just pushed out of public attention. Uh, and um, what I wonder around, right, is that, so 50 years ago, 100 years ago, the number of people who went to college was much smaller, 50%. So today, like in many countries, 60, 70% of people go to college. Okay? So the number of educated people has grown up a thousand times. Okay. But somehow, look, I don't have a sense that this, led, this leads to new renaissance of culture, ideas. In science, yes. We, but we don't seem to have some fundamental new ideas about love or history or art. We're still talking about Aristotle and Plato, you know, and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, Roland Barthes and uh, Marx and so on. So how come very few educated people in the previous century come out of all the good ideas and how come with all this technology, all this connectivity, you know, we, uh, yeah, we're making lots of breakthroughs in science because science is very specialized, but we don't seem to be, all this technology, all this connectivity doesn't seem to help us to make better art uh, or better social cultural theory even better architecture. So I think we really need to think about this very deeply. Something, something must be wrong. Something must be wrong. I don't know what, but something must be wrong here. And with this, with this kind of grim look on news, I think one final question from that would be uh, fitting here, coming from the audience, is about the dissemination of, is about social media communication and about it pertaining to be an activist. Um, to have activist goals. I'm kind of paraphrasing the question. Do you feel there is any impact or importance to sharing and spreading the word regarding police brutality and Black Lives Matter, for instance, or occupation injustices? So this may be a question that uh, relates well, to what earlier. So, you know, I'm going to, okay, so since you already know I'm radical, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, um, I know I, I can say I can maybe I'll say something radical what I think about it um, because to me uh, this uh, kind of very very quick spread right of this new kind of mm-hmm. uh, cycle of information and discussion and protest about police brutality. First of all, again, it's an example of how worlds could become much more global than five years ago. So something like right, happens in one country. The next day, there are protests in dozens of cities worldwide. At least in my lifetime, I don't remember such kind of global reaction. Um, right. But the thing which, you know, the thing which, you know, uh, I find really problematic. So you say, okay, what is the connection between ethnicity, race, and crime, mm-hmm. or race and inequality? You go to Wikipedia, for example, mm-hmm. there's a 60 page article which just summarizes. 500 academic books, and what you find out, it's a very complex issue, right? Mm-hmm. There are lots of different theories in economic, social science, and it's not a simple thing. Mm-hmm. But people are lazy, right? People are not going to read even Wikipedia page. So what I am saying is, right, again, educated people worldwide who don't think and who repeat to me very simplistic things, right? So one thing about police brutality, right? So now you have this kind of slogans in the States, Defund police, uh, defund police, and so on. And the idea, right, that you know, uh, police discriminate against black people. Well, I don't know, but it's true because I'm not black. Uh, so, as a white male, I'm a Jew, so I actually think I'm a minority. You know, Jews until 1970s were discriminated in America, right? But you know, uh, now nobody thinks that. But all I've done is I went to Wikipedia and I said, okay, what are the, what are the rates in crime? You know, like like robbery and also killing between young, between young people in America of different ethnicities. Well, the rate of young blacks to young whites is eight to one. So maybe there's a causal connection why more black people end up in prison because maybe we commit more crimes. Now, why we commit more crimes and how we can change it, that's a different story, right? But to simply claim, okay, you know, police simply uh, uh, police simply arrest black people because they're black. To me, that's, that's kind of meaningless, especially since most of police are black in America, right? Uh, and uh, again, I don't know if a news to claim or you know, there are partic- you know, particular kind of forces. It's possible that, for example, like all this kind of um, robbing of stores, right? In LA, New York, and so on at night, it seems to be it was very organized. But you know, the ability of I think we live in a very kind of mad world, right? Because there are again millions of educated people who choose to only look at one thing and who don't choose to look at another thing, right? So, for example, lots of people don't like companies, but my friends work in companies, right? So I have art students. Some became artists and became very ignorant and evil people, and other people became genius on Facebook, and they're doing something interesting, right? The reason Israel has become a developed country, right? Because is there, because of all the startups and so on, right? So I don't really understand how can educated people be negative about companies because there are good companies, bad companies, and the world is not black and white. Uh, so to me, one of the things which actually prevents the world from changing is I think lots of lo- lots of blindfolds of a kind of, of dominant left intellectual uh, kind of world, which I think. People don't want to think dialectically. We don't want to make business. We don't want to make projects with companies. We just want to attack them. And uh, as a result, nobody wins. You know? So what I want to suggest is my last, right? My last statement, don't, don't think about the broader categories. This is a company. There. Yeah, it's artist. It's good. This is nonprofit. It's good. These are just categories. Look at every time. Look at a particular project, a particular artist. Look at a particular thing. Right? Mm-hmm. Lots, some companies are very innovative, most are not. Few artists are very innovative, most are not, right? Mm-hmm. And the uh, world is very complex, and that's what I learned in a communist country, right? Nothing was black and white. Uh, and uh, I think that somehow, with all our technology, all our education, ta ta ta, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to embrace this complexity. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wonder why. I wonder why. You know? Again, I'm not for global capitalism per se. But global capitalism is way better than global communism. And uh, as we see in the last few months, there's not one, such one thing as capitalism. The way America is going to take care of its people or not is very different from France, it's very different from, right, from Korea and so on. So now we see the differences between so-called capitalistic countries are maybe larger than similarities. 
So don't trust categories, mm -hmm. look at the facts, look at the data and try to think about the world in a more nuanced way. And if computers in the media can help you, then I'm very happy about it. Professor Manovich, with this uh, um, advice and recommendation, it's a good uh, time um, to conclude. And I'm so happy that you uh, were here. Yeah, and I, I apologize, but I wasn't able to answer all the questions. Uh, I'm very sorry about it, but people can always Left email. Left unanswered, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm on Facebook. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can always reach me out. And if you know, if I didn't scare you, my very radical kind of almost well, one of fascist yeah. beliefs. Uh, but you know, I just turned 60 a few months ago, so I thought, you know, what's you know, what's what, what, what okay, okay, the worst, the worst thing which can happen, I will lose my academic job in America. So, what you know, <laughs> I, don't like, I don't like New York anyway. You know? Well, uh, thank yeah. you very much. I think it was really thought provoking in, in so many ways. It was. First thing I was interesting about the, the ways in which you, pre you presented the systemization of, of expression, human expression. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about the question of the tool because, you know, systemization by, you know, by the human body versus the computer, I guess there are some kind of differences between them. But, you know, there are so many other questions that, you know, that can... can that well, are... We could have talked about architecture, you know, which is, you know, I studied architecture in Moscow before I left. And one of the reasons I left career is because I love design, especially interior design and architecture. Right. And, uh, right. you know, we can talk about how modern architecture completely failed, right? Because... They created all these boxes and basically created these ugly cities, right? Uh, and, you know, what are we going to do, right? Uh, you know, all this discussion about the construction we didn't really help us, right? Uh, so how are we going to, you know, how are we going to house the next two billion people? Are yeah. we going to put them in more, con yeah. Sorry, I, I mean, I'm not, but, but I'm saying there's so many interesting things we can talk about, uh, right? Um, how Absolutely. to make architecture, you know, and in fact, that's actually something architects, architects are going to play a much bigger role than AI. Maybe the world will become more ugly, or maybe the world will become a bit better, right? Yeah, because 20th yeah, century architects yeah. made a pretty ugly place, you know, for us. <laughs> always, yeah, always yeah. forced concrete, which is just decaying now. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I also I'm very much like the fact that we're sitting in your kitchen, which, you know, also brings an issue that relation between the private and the public within the AI and, you know, in the realm and the digital realm. But, you know, so, there are so many questions to, that are still open. This, you know, it, you know, once you'll be able to fly and come here again, we'd like to have you physically here and, you know, to do some more things together. I'm sure the film, the school of film and television, also yes. school of architecture, we can collaborate and do so many, so many. I want to remind you that, in fact, for 20 years, I was never professor of theory. I was always professor of art. I was teaching students, right, programming art. I was invited very often to architecture critiques, right, at SciArc and UCLA. I was the first person to teach course in digital cinema using Premiere. At, at, at film school. So yeah. the reason my theory is a bit different because it's a theory from practitioner to practitioners, right? It's for us, it's not for them. And I want to especially thank Ohad because, you know, uh, so many times people interview me or do something with me and we don't bother to look at my recent work. And Ohad really made a study. So he learned more about what's inside my brain than me, myself. And oh he my found God. some interesting things were. And uh, I apologize for being because I kind of lay, I'm a bit tired for being um, you know, very kind of controversial. But I think that, you know, the best thing intellectuals can do is to have a discussion, right? And uh, especially in a place like Israel, right? If we don't have a discussion in Israel, then the world is really coming to an end. Uh, so yeah. once again, right, uh, I'm sometimes play devil's advocate, but not to provoke people, but also, you know, to expose them to perhaps some very strange but different ideas but these ideas i believe in because it's kind of my experience of my own life and uh you know uh about the you know the corona virus yeah so i said yeah maybe we shouldn't talk about all the time we should do other things but at the same time we do have to talk about it and it is an opportunity right to do things differently uh like for example i think harvard a few other schools said you know we're not going to open physically we'll open online but we're going to use resources to change everything well most schools don't have these resources uh so we can see okay what about us what about educators are we simply going to be teaching on zoom or are we going to be doing something different right for example why not have graduate programs where everything is virtual mm -hmm. why do i have to belong to one university why all PhD students have to travel to city x where I'm only meeting once once a week, right? I think graduate education in some ways can be definitely digitized. Mm -hmm. And education, along with, I think, few other fields, it's one of the most conservative fields in the world, right? We still give people PhD like in the 15th century. Uh, so uh, 
we have to do a good job. And what I like about architectural education, film education, is sitting where you're working on materials, right? You're seeing what people are doing. But I, I think, you know, and of course, like they're underfunded, blah, blah, blah. But still, let's use this opportunity to try something different. And my students are, and hopefully our students will help us and not just run away. We hope so. So we thanks, again. thanks again. And thank you very much, Ohad, for a wonderful lead of this uh, conversation. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Next week, we are, we're going to have Professor Carl Martin uh, from NYU. Dr. Sharon Lavi Aronson. Aronson Lavi will interview her. Uh, Carl, she's, uh, she's a professor of theater. So we'll, I, I assume we're going to have a little bit different discussion next year about art and theater today. So thank you all. I'm, and just, have I'm just making kind of screenshots of questions. So as I said, uh, people can also always ask me on Facebook. So thank you so much. And sorry I was a bit stressed out about this thing, but you know, I take it very seriously because ultimately all we have left is Zoom, right? Uh, without Zoom, like I would basically, like, you know, because I'm sitting in Korea, I don't know anybody, but for Zoom, like I'm having a good time. So when you told me we're going to use different format, I was just so, so paranoid. So I'm sorry, I'm like, uh, sometimes take these things too seriously because it's somebody who works with technology. I always expect technology to break down. Uh, <laughs> even if it's done out by a company called Zoom, so I got a bit scared when you told me it's a new format, but I think it works very well. So very thank well. you again, and uh, no, uh, time. See, see you later. Yes, thank sir. you, and we hope I hope we didn't tire you so too much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye everybody. Bye. bye.